Two local men discovered the Range Rover at 8 o'clock this morning as they made their way along the farm track. Two men in the front that I see in and looked as though they were asleep. You know, I mean, we've seen vehicles parked down there before and usually it's people going off to take their dogs for a walk or a courting couple. You know, we don't really expect to find something like that first thing in the morning. Mr Nichols said that on a number of occasions prior to the murders, still... I'd asked him if he could get hold of a gun. On the 6th of December 1995, he had spoken to Steen on the telephone a number of times. He had met him by arrangement at around 5pm. Wombs had also been present. Steele had said that we're going to collect some others and bring them to a place where a drug deal was going to take place. Wombs and Nichols went in a Volkswagen Passat to a car park at the Halfway House pub, where Steele was already parked in his Toyota Hilux. They watched and saw a Range Rover arrive and park next to Steele's vehicle. Wombs said that Tate was in the Range Rover. Wombs then told Nichols to drive to Retterdon and turn off the road onto a farm track to the right. Wombs got out the car there, taking a canvas bag with him. Wombs told Nichols to wait for his telephone call and then come back and get him. Nichols drove off to another pub to wait, but could not obtain a good signal on his mobile telephone there, so he drove back past where he dropped off Wombs and parked in Retterdon. Wombs telephoned him and said, come and get us. Nichols returned to the farm track, and Wombs, and then Steele, got into the car. Wombs was wearing plastic gloves, which appeared to be speckled with blood. Steele told Nichols to drive off, which he did. Steele said they won't fuck with us again, and Nichols assumed that from this, someone had been killed. He saw Steele pass over parts of a shotgun to Wombs. Steele described Wombs as a cold-hearted bastard because Wombs had handed Steele a gun, and then Wombs had immediately shot all three men in the Range Rover. Nichols said that he had learned of the identity of the other two victims from the news. Steele had told him sometime after the murders that the three men had been tempted to the scene by a story of a cocaine deal. The cocaine was to be imported by plane. Steele told him that the gun had been ground up and thrown into the sea. Steele told him that Tate had borrowed some money from two brothers to buy the drugs and had failed to repay it. He had told the brothers that Steele had not repaid him. Steele had heard that Mr Tate had planned to deliver him to the brothers and then shoot him in front of them. A few days after the murders, Nichols had been offered a shotgun and agreed to buy it. He passed it on to Steele. A shotgun was later found by police, hidden in the loft of Steele's house. The bodies of the three victims were discovered in the Range Rover by two local farmers at around about 8am on the morning of the 7th of December 1995. A forensic scientist gave evidence that he believed that eight shots had been fired. Seven cartridge cases were recovered, all of which had come from the same weapon. The Crown adduced evidence of telephone calls made between the telephones belonging to the parties from August 1995 until the murders. Evidence was given regarding the location of the mobile telephone transmitters and the routing of calls on the day of the murders. Two calls were made by Wombs' mobile telephone to Nichols' mobile telephone at 18.59. One call lasted about one second, indicating a poor signal. It was the Crown's case that the calls were made from the vicinity of Workhouse Lane, the site of the murders. The Crown brought forward evidence to show that the second call at 18.59 which lasted four seconds, was routed through a transmitter sighted at Hockley and that this was consistent with the call having been made in the Workhouse Lane area. The court heard evidence in relation to the mobile telephones of two of the victims, Patrick Tate and Anthony Tucker. The billing data for those telephones showed that the last calls that were made at 1707 
Tucker's mobile lasting 2 minutes and 9 seconds, and 1826, Tate's mobile lasting 26 seconds. The billing data for Mr. Tucker's mobile showed that a number of incoming calls were diverted to the voicemail from 1909 onwards on the 6th of December 1995. There was no evidence that he attempted to retrieve the voicemail messages which were left. The available cell site data for Tate's mobile suggested that the last incoming call which he answered began at 1844 on the 6th of December. The Crown relied heavily on the timings of the various calls to suggest that the victims were murdered at some point between the end of the 1844 call to Tate and the beginning of Wimes's 1859 call to Nichols. The court heard evidence that about 1810, on the 6th of December 1995, Claire Kerry had arrived at Tate's address to meet him. The lights were on and the music was playing. Tate had left a note saying that he had had to pop out for about half an hour and asked her to wait. He did not return. The court also heard evidence that the victims had a dinner reservation at the Global Net Cafe in Romford on the evening of the 6th of December. It appears that they intended to attend. The reservation had been rearranged that day. None of the victims attended the restaurant, nor was there any evidence that they had contacted anyone to explain their absence. Steele and Wimes were arrested and interviewed under caution in relation to the murders. They made no substantive replies when questioned. It was Steele's case that he had been testing his boat rather than importing drugs when he was arrested on the evening of the 7th and 8th of November 1995. He had been elsewhere at the time of the murders. It was put to Nichols in cross-examination that it was Nichols who had been importing drugs and that Steele had only gone with him to Holland to assist in recovering money. It was put to Nichols that he had, with the assistance of a corrupt police officer, set up Steele and Wimes in relation to the murders. Nichols denied these allegations. Michael Steele gave evidence. He had previously been convicted of importing drugs by plane and served a nine-year sentence. He had brought and adapted the boat, but had used it for diving. He had not asked Nichols to obtain a gun for him and knew nothing of the gun found in his loft of his house. The telephone conversations between Nichols, Worms and himself on the 6th of December had been in relation to collecting a trailer from one of Worms's relations to pick up Mr Nichols's car that had broken down. Steele had collected the trailer and gone home when he saw some people who were interested in buying his house. He had not revealed this to the police when interviewed because he was advised not to answer questions. Jack Wimes gave evidence and denied any involvement in drugs importation or the murders. He had gone out in Steele's boat on the 7th of November to help test it. He had gone to Ostend with Steele to help him bring back some money for Nichols. On the 6th of December, he had gone to collect a car for Nichols. Steele had helped him by collecting the trailer to put the car on. He had not answered questions in interviews because he realised that Nichols was trying to implicate him in the murders and was concerned that if he said the wrong thing, he might implicate himself in something he had not done. Wimes, Steele and Corey were convicted of conspiracy to import drugs. Wimes and Steele were convicted of the murders of Tate, Tucker and Rolf. Steele was acquitted of possession of the shotgun. Thank you.